The Bible says, now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. The God of peace. Some of you need peace here this morning. And God wants to give you some peace. There's only one person who can dispense peace, real peace. And that's the God of peace. How's this for peace for you? He brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. He said, well, if he was so powerful, if Jesus was powerful, why why'd he have to die because of this? It says later, later in that verse in Hebrews 13, 20, he said, by the blood of the eternal covenant. The only reason the ever-living Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the Son of the God of Peace, ever had to die was so that he could shed his blood to give you grace. Does that give you some peace? Do you feel seen? It gives me peace this morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at James Island Christian Church. I just want to say thank you so much for coming, especially if you're visitors here with us this morning. I pray that God gives you a revelation more of who he is this morning after we leave. Um, before I get into the sermon, I just want to give a kind of update on uh, my family, on Odessa and I. Um, uh, last week I was not here. I was supposed to be the service leader, but we thought that my grandfather was passing away. So I had to rush up to Wilmington. I was going to say goodbye and be there with him. Um, but by God's grace, um, I, it seemed like he got a second wind, and he's, he, he's still going to pass away, unfortunately, as stage four uh, mesothelioma. But, but uh, um, he, uh, I got a, an extra weekend with him that I did not think I was going to get. Um, and then, then Tim Fowler ruined me this morning. Um, because uh, before I went up to go be with my granddad, my wife, uh, my wife said, here's a song to help you. I'd never heard this song, and it was the hymn of heaven. <laughs> and I said, wow, so I've been listening to that. And then when I walked in this morning and they were practicing the hymn of heaven, I just like, oh, no. <laughs> Something's going to take over me I can't control. So, <laughs> I mean, isn't that great? My granddad's two generations before me, and he's going to die in Christ. He's been washed by the blood of the eternal covenant. And one day, me, with all the generations of heaven, are going to shout out with Jesus, the Lord reigns. And we're going to talk about the day, why that is so important to rejoice that the Lord reigns. He's not just a savior, he's a king. And he's going to reign in a kingdom where his way is what happens. So, I laughed a lot this week because I thought with, my, with this passage and some other ones I've preached recently, no one is ever going to want to hear me preach again. I preached about judgment and I preached 72 verses in a psalm and, and then I get like the antichrist. So, I mean, it's... So I, I don't, I don't, I didn't think I know who's scheduling the sermons, but I thought they loved me, so it's really confusing. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to to bring you it, my my favorite thing to do. My favorite thing to do. I have a lot of just, you know, there's fun things in this world, but my absolute favorite thing to do is to give hope. I love giving hope, and I, I want to do that. I want to give you some hope today. I want to give you some peace today, and it's through Jesus. And we're going to find that out by way of this crazy guy called the man of lawlessness. So the question I'm going to ask this morning, how do Christians act when the world is ending? Let's read those first two verses again. It says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or letters seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So, Paul's, we, we finished up last year the first letter that Paul the Apostle wrote to this church in this Greek city called uh, Thessalonica. And um, he helped plant a church there, and immediately after the church was planted and believers came in, uh, there was intense persecution. 
and Paul had to leave. So he wrote the first letter of the Thessalonians. And in that, he was encouraging them, strengthening them, and uh, uh, um, uh, just giving them hope and comfort. And, uh, and so he thought that was good. He sent someone to drop that letter off, and then uh, uh, sometime after, he got another letter from them. And it seems some of the hope did not sink in like it should have. And on top of that, people uh, were lying to them, quite frankly. There were some lies coming in. And one of the reasons, on top of chapter 1, which Brother Ralph preached last week, um, to, uh, to encourage these people while they're under affliction, tribulation, remember the tri tribulum, the, 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 the sifting like wheat, getting the chaff out of your life, um, while he was preaching, while he wrote that to them, he switched to this next topic, was they were under alarm by a false teaching. We don't know all of necessarily what was being taught, but the thing that seemed to shake them most was people were saying that the Lord had already come, that the king had already come. Now, if I told you right now this is as good as it's going to get, Jesus is back, would you be shaken? Yeah, this would not be the... It's not the afterlife you were hoping for, okay? And this, is, this is not exactly um, what would give you hope. And on top of that, they were shaken somehow because what are the consequences of that? If Jesus is back and it doesn't feel like Jesus is reigning, was Jesus who he said he was? Or if Jesus is back and he said who he said he was and I'm not with Jesus, was I not who I thought I was? And they were just wondering about Jesus' identity and their identity and... And it led to fear, and it led to discouragement. And um, uh, you don't need that on top of the affliction you're already feeling from persecution from religious authorities and in that area. So Paul was writing to them to encourage them with the truth. He said, that's not true. Then he says something in verse 2 that I love. He says, don't be quickly shaken in mind. I was talking to someone this week who's a, who's a um, licensed counselor. And I said, isn't that a great counseling verse? <laughs> Don't be qu quickly shaken in your mind. How often do we go straight to fear? The, the image I had on is, you know, I watched a lot of Fox News this past weekend. And, and you know when that breaking news Chiron comes on? breaking news and you're like oh my gosh it's a balloon you know and, and and you're just like what's about to happen and and um you could just see like there's just hours and hours and hours of talk and fear and i was sitting there because it wasn't my tv someone else was and i was like wow if you just sat under this all the time you'd be quickly shaken in mind You get in the car, car breaks down. Ah! I don't have money. There's relationship issues. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Health problems. Ah! 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 Your joy gets emptied out of your body so quickly. That's not what kingdom of heaven citizens act like. That's not who we are as people. It says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is, is, is stuck on you. I know Ralph right now, I can feel him wanting to tell the Hebrew translation of that. I can feel it right now. It's, the Hebrew is literally shalom, which means peace, and then another shalom. Shalom, shalom, double shalom, perfect peace do you realize there's impervious invincible peace available to you today if you just stick your mind on the king of kings you know it says god sits in heaven and he laughs he laughs at all the hurry and scurry and the plans and everything he laughs because he knows who's in control he is and we're his kids okay we're his sons we're his daughters we can trust him. God doesn't want you to be in fear. Instead, he wants to root in the truth. Paul corrects them. He said, let no one deceive you in any way. 
For that day will not come unless the rebellion first comes and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? I, I, lo I love that fatherly kind of like just, hey, hey guys, remember? <laughs> I told you about this. So what were they afraid of? That the kingdom had come. Jesus was back and they'd missed out or he'd missed out. or he, Some type of version of a lie, fear in their mind because they didn't think the promises of God were true. And so Paul was reminding them of the truth. Do you know how much true doctrine gives peace? This is why we fight for it. This is why we have a foundations class. Uh, it may be 10 weeks. We're actually giving you the short version. It's like a 20-week class. We believe that true doctrine from God as a church is what gives you peace, what gives you hope. Not just, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, do not be blown away by every wind of doctrine. It's so easy to get blown in this culture, this multi-voiced culture. So we, our job as leaders, as preachers and teachers and home group leaders and kids ministry leaders and, and whatever capacity that God's given you to teach over others is to teach the truth of God so that the peace of God reigns in your heart so that you can hold on to the hope of God by the faith of God. So he was reminding them that there's a certain sequence of events before the end comes, and you need to look out for the signpost and not what someone else is saying. And the signpost that he got was this great guy. Um, he means well, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. I don't know if his parents named him that. I don't. <laughs> He's just a bad guy. We don't, we don't know who he is, and frankly, a lot, frankly, Frankly, a lot of Christians waste a lot of time trying to figure out who this guy is. Is he the Pope? Is he the uh, president? I think every president has been declared the Antichrist at some point or another. Um, it, you know, is he Bill Belichick? Is he, is he something? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Forgive me, Jesus. We don't, but, but, but what Paul was saying was we don't have to fret, Okay. We don't have to fret because guess what? The one that I always hear is the president. So let's just use him as an example. Is Joe Biden the Antichrist? Okay. <laughs> so let's, let's test that. Let's, okay, let's test that and let's be honest and serious for a second. Let's test that. Has Joe Biden gone into the temple and declared himself God? Okay, so he's not the man of lawlessness. So we can kind of rest for a little bit and not be hurried in our mind and scurried in our minds. The thing about the man of lawlessness, this evil, wicked man who's going to come, I, I believe he's going to come before Jesus comes back and gathers us all to himself. It's not going to be a mystery. It's a mystery when it will happen, but it's not going to be a mystery when it happens. When we see a guy walk into the temple and call himself God. That's the clue. That's the clue. And so what was Paul saying? The question when we hear that is when we find out who the Antichrist is or the man of lawlessness, there's a lot of debate on who's who. What are we supposed to do? Let's say he does it today. What are we supposed to do? And the secret is the same thing we've always done. Obey God, trust God, and talk to God. When your life goes off the rails and trials and pain comes, you obey God, you trust God, and you talk to God. Okay? When life's good, And you're just grateful, and you feel like you can genuinely sit around and say, man, I, you know, I, there's nothing really burdensome on my heart right now. What do you do? You obey God, you trust God, and you talk to God. 
See, my goal, my, one of my biggest passions for God's church is to take the extraordinary, the supernatural, and, 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 and the prophecies, and, and all these things that, that can capture our imagination vainly sometimes. I just want to take it all down to the ordinary. God is doing all of that so that he was simply producing us more obedience. So we're given this prophecy in this little tiny letter. That I, it was this, I'm not trying to, was this anybody's first time reading that or hearing that? I mean, I don't remember reading it that often growing up. But God's given this just to remind us, I think he's in control. And that our hope needs to stay fixed. And that we don't need to hurry and scurry and doubt. We just need to keep on doing the simple, ordinary things of obedience in the kingdom. And the answer will not be, what do we need to do? But wait, Jesus is going to do something. Because Jesus is the great warrior. Jesus is the great warrior. Read verses 6, 7, and 8 again. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed, talking about the man of lawlessness in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So, this is one of those verses where I was like, Paul, you know, maybe they know, but we don't know. <laughs> Can you tell for the folks at home, 6 and 7 says, well, you guys know what's restraining the man of lawlessness right now. I wish I could. Then I, <laughs> I, I didn't read anything that had that. It's still a mystery a bit. And for whatever reason, God didn't want to reveal that entirely to us. We can guess what's restraining the man of lawlessness right now. Ultimately, it's probably God. <laughs> I mean, like, that's something he would stop. Um, but the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There may not be the law, man of lawlessness, but there's a lot of men of lawlessness around, right? And there may not be the great rebellion right now, but there's a lot of rebellions going on right now. There's still some small aspects of it that are happening right now that we can say, hey, the fullness of the end times is not yet, but we already know this is the problem. People are rebelling against God, and people are lawless, and there's evil, wicked rulers who rule in this world. I don't care what you think of any politician. If you stand back, for America at least, if you stand back and if you look at the, the global strategy, most of the rulers of this world are wicked, wicked, evil, vile people. And we know some people in these countries, and they feel powerless, and all they can do is pray. I've, I wish we were like that. I wish we could just say, okay, let's just pray. If we're worried, let's not complain and gripe and sin. Let's pray. Let's pray for our leaders. Let's pray that justice reigns in the land. Psalm 72, 1 says, Lord, give the king your justice and your righteousness. Lord, would you give the president your justice? And your righteousness. Would you give the governor your justice and righteousness? Would you give the county council members your righteousness? Would you make them rule like you would rule? And we pray for that. But we know men are wicked in their hearts. And they don't want to serve God. And they don't want to love God. And there's still some who suppress the truth. And this guy who's coming, whoever he is, he's going to be the full realization of all the most wicked, evil, spiteful tyrants to the point where his title will be the man of lawlessness. But something's going to happen to him. And this is where I want to go. I try to, you know, Russ and Chris and, and Ralph, they give such great quotes in their sermons and they give some beautiful pictures and videos. I barely do that sometimes. I just, I just, yeah, so I, I, I saw something this morning on our way in, and I, I, I asked her, I said, can you please take a picture? I said, that's not an accident. So if we have it up, could we put it up on a slide? So that was on the way from Goose Creek. Apparently, you, you have to leave Goose Creek to go to heaven, but uh, there. 
so it, this, this picture really does not do it justice. It was just like these billowing tunnels of clouds, and the sun was just like blasting out of the clouds, and these rays were coming down. And I didn't even have to tell. I, I, I said to everybody, I said, look at that. And Gideon said, that looks like heaven. <laughs> I said, it does look like heaven. And my imagination started working. I said, boy, I'd love to see some angels fly out of that thing right about now. I'd love to see Jesus fly out of that right now. I'd love to see him come and with the breath of his mouth destroy the wicked evil of this age. There's a lot of things in our life we don't understand. And one of them is we don't know exactly why God lets evil people rule and reign. But we have to fix our trust in him and to know he knows better. And I'm thinking of a passage now in Scripture. Jesus stood before Pilate, and he was brought in by the religious authorities. And Jesus was silent, and Pilate kept on asking them questions. Are you the Son of God? Are you this or that? Blah, 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 blah. And do you know the only time when Jesus spoke? He said, Pilate said to Jesus, he said, don't you realize I have authority to release you or kill you? And Jesus, knowing that he's the king of all ages, he's the son of the ancient of days, he couldn't keep quiet. He said, you have only the authority given to you by heaven. So when we go around and scratch our head at the authorities of this age, they've been put there by heaven. And I don't know why. I know there's immense pain and suffering done at the hands of these people. But one of the things that gives us faith and hope is that we know that no one is there outside of the control and will of God. He is sovereignly ordained that those people would be there. And But one day <laughs> we're going to be coming from Goose Creek and it's going to be real. Okay? Amen? And God is going to, Jesus is going to come and it says with fiery mighty angels and the, and the trumpet of the sound of the archangel and the dead in Christ will rise. And they said, and, and he said, and thus will we be ever, ever with the Lord. And Jesus is going to come down, he's going to go to the temple, and he's going to go, and evil's going to be dead forever. He is not worried about nuclear armistice. His breath can blow it all away. So hang tight, have hope, and in the meantime, while the evil is around, this is how we act. We need to remember something deep and true about ourselves. You are what you love, not what you think is true. You are what you love, not what you think is true. Verse 9 says, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power to false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see why well, I think this guy's going to get away with calling himself God? Is he's going to be doing some things that are going to seem pretty convincing. Jesus said in some instances, he said, if possible, he would have deceived the elect because of the power and signs and wonders that he's going to do. That people are going to believe him and people are going to follow him. There is power, not just ideas, the kingdom of heaven is fighting against. There is an energy and a strength that you would be foolish to approach with, with laissez-faire or whatever, I got this attitude. God has, Satan has deceived the very best of us, the very smartest of us, the very strongest of us, the most godly, the least godly. He is more powerful than you. He's been around at least before creation. 
of this universe. He has power and wisdom just from years of experience alone, but a cunning that we'll never, ever approach. So much so that the best way we can fight Satan is to already admit that we're weaker than him and do what we're told in the letter of Jude, that even the Archangel Gabriel, who's pretty powerful, or Archangel Michael, who's pretty powerful, the way he defeated Satan was saying, the Lord rebuke you. We need the power of God to destroy the power of Satan. You know, this is, this is starting to flood our culture in more and more obvious ways. Last Sunday at the Grammys, um, uh, uh, a uh, um, performer by the name of Sam Smith uh, dressed up as the devil and had this really just depraved ceremony on television and, and unfortunately I heard something that the Grammys um, viewership actually went up this year um, and you see that and um, and you see that and it's people who love Jesus and love the truth and don't want to see our friends our family members our neighbors influenced by something like that um, he, he sang a song called Unholy and the, and the song is, is just about the, the joy of having an affair and um, in even some interviews, he said the joy of having a, 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 what they called a queer affair. And the songwriter and the performer with him is, is uh, a, tr- a, a transgender man, who a man, born a man, and uh, thought he was a woman. And at one point, he was the youngest transgender person in the whole world to ever s- have gender uh, reassignment surgery. And... Um, when they won, that's the first thing they went to. They said, uh, um, that is who I am. This is good because I'm transgender and I won this. And I tell you what, like, we can make fun of that stuff, guys. We can look at it and get disgusted by it. But, uh, man, I think the church's response should be weeping instead. We ought to love these people. They're deceived. We're we're no better than them. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I was weeping just sitting there. I was like, why do I get to preach today? Why do I get to preach the gospel of Jesus this morning? I don't deserve this. I'm the second son, second born son of a Southern Baptist preacher man. And I, you know, I... I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. But he lets me. He lets me. It's nothing. I've done nothing. So I just want as a people. Let's just, let's, can we pray for Sam Smith and Kim right now? Kim's his name. So Jesus, we pray that your power would show itself more powerful. And Lord, forgive us as a people when we get arrogant and we walk in the way of the mocker and we mock people who are deceived that if we weren't so, we would be deceived. It was all by grace. So I pray that you would save Sam and you would save Kim and that their testimony would be a power against the power of the evil one. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another thing that's happening in our culture, along with this familiarity with satanic images and satanic beliefs, which at the heart is just rebellion, is um, a fascination with the power that comes along with Satan. I've been struck for a number of years now um, when I go into Barnes and Noble and, uh, or some other bookstore and slowly the aisle on New Age philosophy and, w- and literally it'll just say witchcraft. <laughs> they, they stop saying New Age to some sections are witchcraft and occultism. And um, it's gotten bigger, almost bigger than the Christian section. <laughs> In some sorts, bigger than the Christian section. And I see, oh, just watch. I just watch people buy and buy and buy. 
And I, my heart goes out because I know they're looking for a power, okay? I know they're looking for a power to make their life better. Most of it is just comes from uh, a benign desire. Can I say this to you? There's no such thing as safe witchcraft. There's no such thing as safe fortune telling. There's no such thing as safe tarot card reading. Okay, you can get a prediction of your future, but you can also get a demon. I'm telling you right now, I do not speak from lack of experience on this. I go into people's homes and I pray for them. And I know people who've incurred dark spirits in their life because they've messed around with things they shouldn't have messed around with. And he'll give you something, but he'll take everything. That's Satan's way. God's way is to ask little and give you everything. Ephesians 2, 7 says, At the ages to come, he will display for us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. If you follow the way of wicked power, you, you'll just end up like your leader whose name is Son of Destruction. So, if there's anyone here today who may be practicing and playing with some things that they shouldn't, I tell you in love, don't do it. Don't do it. Run away from it. It'll only bring torment to your life and to your family. I feel the Lord gave me a specific uh, prophetic word as well. There's a woman here who... Um, I could see you with some items and paraphernalia in your hand and that you started going down the way of that because you wanted some power because some men in your life treated you poorly. And God, the, Satan's used that bitterness to turn you into his power. And um, I just want to tell you today that You have a father who loves you. And it says that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Some men may have hurt you in the past, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus, the true ultimate meaning of a man is here and he loves you. And I would love for you to, if you have even some in your pocket right now, just throw it at this front and confess to Jesus and let us hug you and love you. And, and we want to just show you that God is with you and that Jesus is for you. I'm seeing too, I, I feel like God wants to warn. Often it's women who get in these things because um, women feel weak because of how they've been treated and they don't feel as powerful. So they, um, that God uses that too because our best prayer warriors in this church are women because <laughs> they know where their power comes from. It doesn't come from, you know, themselves. And I see too a, a, a pyramid and you, you're getting wrapped up and it's like a pyramid scheme for money. And, and it's just consuming all your time and all your thought and all your energy. And, and, and God wants to say to you, that's not a benign, benevolent thing. That's a thing that has, that is not, that's taking you away from the Lord. And he wants to release you from it. So in Jesus' name, be free. And then we follow. We follow what we love, not what we know to be true. Verse 10 says, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them to a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Pleasure in unrighteousness. Be careful what you love. It leads you away from the truth. Some of you need to go back to the truth and ask God to change your love so you can know the truth better. A lot of false doctrines they start out really happy looking, but they lead into dark places. I say this with complete brokenness and love. And if you are watching this somehow, brother, I love you. In Jesus' name, I love you. But I have a friend who, who he, was, he was a really good friend to me. And, and a 
lot of different ways. And he was a pastor and he started going down the road and God revealed to me, he said, I, I heard him say, I'm for gay marriage. And this Holy Spirit told me he's living in an open marriage. And as soon as I heard that, I started praying. And then I called some people I knew and they said, yeah, it's true. And he's not repentant and he's hardened. And so then he came out with other false doctrines like hell's not real or all these other things. Let me tell you, truth matters because it leads you away. I still pray for my brother that he's turned, that can be turned around. Often false doctrine leads to behavior to however you want. Because we like what makes us feel good. So don't stand in the power and the false doctrine of the evil one, but instead stand firm. Stand firm. Verse 13 says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in truth. In the midst of a dark world, I tell you what, I love that I get to share my life with brothers and sisters who know Jesus. I have some family that's far from Jesus, and sometimes uh, when I'm in a meeting with Russ, he's, he's older than me, so I look up to him like an older brother, and, and I said, boy, I'm just, I'm just glad I have an older brother who loves Jesus. <laughs> There's nothing like it. So Paul, he's thinking in the midst of this dark world, no matter how hard it gets, man, I'm just thankful for you. I'm thankful for you that you're here right now, and you're listening to the gospel. I thank for all of you who serve and love Jesus. Because this was the spirit in you taking you apart so that you could believe the truth. God did that, not you. He took you and saved you. He took us and saved us. Paul loved the Thessalonians in verse 14 because God changed them by the spirit and truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't even understand what that means. You know, today's the Super Bowl Sunday, and someone's going to win, the Eagles or the Chiefs, okay? And one of them boys is going to touch that trophy and going to raise it up and say, I basically lived my whole life for this. They were excited. And I tell you, it's an awesome thing to win a Super Bowl. Carolina Panthers will do it next year, okay? I'm going to... I'm not, I don't believe in naming and claiming it, but I'm going to try, at least, in some things. Um, and that's a great glory, and that's a great honor, and they get rings, and they get money, and they get fame. But God's working to give you the same glory Jesus is going to get. I mean, what? It says... And Revelation 1 says his feet are like bronze, his eyes like fire, his hair white as wool. When he speaks, it's like trumpet and moving waters. I want that, you know. I want One day, Jesus is going to glorify us and make us beautiful and make us something more than we could ever possibly imagine. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says what Jesus is going to do in you is so incomprehensibly glorious. It's like understanding what an oak tree is just by looking at an acorn. Did you go to the angel oak? That started with an acorn this big. And now people go and donate money and see it in all its glory. The same thing is going to happen to you. Verse 15, he says, so then, brothers, stand firm. Stand firm again. And hold to the traditions that you were taught. By us, either by spoken word or letter, test by or by our letter. Guys, hold firm. There's a constant need to evolve thinking in our culture. But I've not seen peace given that replaces the simple gospel. Faith delivered over to the saints once and for all. So trust the word. Be in the word. And don't deviate from it. Don't think that new philosophies or new psychologies are going to replace what the peace that Jesus brings. And he brings the blessing of the eternal, covenant, uh, eternal comfort. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word.
don't trade in temporary comfort for eternal comfort. It's tempting. Put down that alcohol. Put down that Johnny Walker. Put down, put down what you're seeking for temporary comfort. It's going to only lead you astray. Go for living water. The eternal comfort of Jesus. He'll give you that. And he'll give you good hope. You know, there's some bad hope. We're about to e enter a season in 2024 of bad hope. Okay, y'all? There's going to, in South Carolina, good gracious, we're going to see it on the TV all the time, aren't we? Campaign commercials. Now, I'm all for godly government. Don't, should trust me. But at the end of that, we'll never be the good hope of Jesus. Stay firm and stand firm on the good hope of Jesus. And it says, through grace, I love that. I love that. It's not through how good John can do, because if it was, whew, man, grace, a gift to you from a rich king. And he's going to comfort your hearts, verse 17. And he's going to establish them. He's going to do that. Some of you are so worried that you're not who you want to be yet. He'll do it. Keep on going to him. He's going to establish your heart. Some of you want to do big things and change the world. Be patient. He'll do it. Verse 17, he'll establish every work and word. He'll do it. Stand by. Go to his grace and trust him and be filled with that. So as the band comes up, if you're here, um, if you're here today and you, and, and you wouldn't quite call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. And you don't really even know why you're here this morning. And, and um, there's a temptation to come. It would have been easy to, to leave. But a friend invited you. And, or you're just here by yourself. And, or maybe you're here with a family member. God is coming back. Jesus is going to come back. And the only thing that will save us from the breath of his mouth of destruction is the blood of his, of his arms, his hands, his side. Now, there's been a lot of false beliefs and philosophies and you've just been searching for hours on Facebook or YouTube and you've just been trying to find these things that will save you. And you're thinking right now, it couldn't be this simple gospel. It can't be that this is the way when all this other stuff seems so sophisticated and so true. Here's the gospel. You were created by an eternal God. And you were made for a purpose. You are not an accident. It says that he knows the number of hairs on the top of your head. It said he knitted you together when you were still in your mom's tummy. And then he came in this world in this thing called sin introduced by a rebellious enemy infected your heart, infected your flesh, and you were without hope. But God, because he loved us, sent his one and only son. And he's the only one who ever lived perfectly. And he died on a cross. That's why we celebrate the cross. You may not know that right now, but that's why we celebrate that. Because that right there tells us that the punishment for our wickedness was taken away. And he died, and then it says in Hebrews 13, 20, the God of peace brought him again from the dead. And if you trust this God of peace, he's going to bring you back from the dead just like he brought Jesus back from the dead. And so come, come this morning. Come now. Don't waste a second. Let, let him wash you. Let him wash that. You got, some, you got some things on your conscience right now, don't you? Got some sin, got some pains, got some regrets. Things that you think that if you hide, you'll be okay, but God sees them. But guess what? He who knows you most loves you best. So come into the light. Let him cleanse you this morning and come to Christ for the very first time. If you're here 
today and you're a believer, do not be shaken in your mind. Don't let the news chirons of your life shaken you so quickly. Let it be deafened in your ears and may you have perfect peace because your mind is stayed on him. Stand firm, be in the word, and be established by grace. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now and we trust you. And we pray that you would establish every heart this morning and every good work and every good word and that you would draw people to yourself. So in Jesus' name I pray, amen.